Hi, everyone. I'm Say, and I'd like to welcome you to Black Lives Matter Heart Conversations. My perspective on DEI has dramatically shifted through heart-to-heart -heart conversations. So that's why I invited my friend Grant Doster. He's the former DNI Global Practice Lead for LHH. So I wanted to have a chat with him and invite all of you into the conversation. A little bit about Grant. He has a very extensive, impressive background. He has spent 20 years practicing diversity and inclusion uh, as a leader and has held several executive leadership positions for companies like Pepsi, Cola, Miller Brewing Company, uh, VP Global Sales Marketing for Disney, yay Disney, and SVP for CHW Multicultural Advertising. Uh, Grant was also an adjunct professor at University of California, Riverside, uh, University of Redlands, and guest lecturer at University of Southern California. That's pretty cool. I'm from Southern California, know that yeah. too well. Uh, Grant has also launched his own consultancy, Doster Training Consultant, uh, Consulting LLC, focused on diversity, inclusion, and belonging, that he launched all the way back in 2005. You can contact Grant at dostertraining.com. And mm -hmm. last but not least, he, him and his wife currently reside in the greater Los Angeles area. So welcome, Grant. Thank you, Say. One of my favorite people on earth. Thank you so Aww, much. Oh, you're too kind. You're too kind. So let's dive right on in. Uh, DEI, what's behind all this racism and sexism, ableism, ageism, you know, that's causing so much consternation, especially now? That's a fantastic question to say. And I think that uh, we could probably fill in the next few hours just going through a lot of the things that contribute to it. But let me just try and bundle everything together and call it fear. It's fear. Um, I'm accredited in psychological safety. And one of the things that we have found uh, in the, new, well, I'm not a neuroscientist, but my professor where I got accredited through Academy of Brain-Based Leadership uh, have found is that the brain operates of some very basic fear resistant type of activities. And it's the amygdala really that responds to fear-based things. So if something comes at us that's outside of that which feels comfortable or something that's part of our, our um, it's not, it's not uh, something that's outside of our purview or something we understand. Uh, if it's something outside, we don't understand it and we wanna push back on it. We wanna push it out. We wanna push it away. So that's what's happening basically is our amygdala is responding. Now, let me be clear about something. It's no excuse for bad behavior and hateful behavior. You know, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's a base psychological uh, event happening and it's supposed to keep us from being eaten by uh, saber tooth tigers. It's not supposed to uh, keep us from making better hiring decisions uh, based on objective uh, questions and, and material. So we've got this prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex is supposed to dampen the effect of that amygdala response, allowing us to be a little bit more purposeful and a lot more deliberate in our approach to interaction with other people. Now, all those things being said, there's a psychological piece. From an emotional piece, that fear that's, that's also coming from a psychological foundation is also emotive because we are brought up in a society that says that this is the standard. And you know, I don't think that I'd be the only one in history to say that globally, especially in this country, uh, there's a certain standard and there's a supremacy that's attached to that standard. And most people would agree that it's probably a middle-aged straight white guy. Now, middle-aged straight white guys are not my enemy. Racism is my enemy. So in order to break out of that, and Kendi in his books, uh, and I hope I'm paraphrasing correctly, suggests that these are policy type uh, decisions and policy types of uh, milieus that have been created and this construct of what the norm is and that remains supreme. Anything other than that becomes uh, an ism. It becomes a sexism, a racism, a heterosexism, uh, a triumphalism. All of these isms are a result of being the outside of the group and being substandard to in theory and thought societally based on what we have constructed to be the standard. And uh, I'm here to say that it's just not true. And the only way to combat it, uh, I guess we'll talk about in a few moments, is to fess up and say, you know what? 
I may be an ism, I may be a racist, I may be a sexist, or maybe I'm a recovering racist or sexist or heterosexist. But at the end of the day, the only way to get off the hook is to get on the hook. Because just because you have these biases don't make mean that it's a character issue necessarily. However, in my opinion, if you continuously walk away from these responsibilities and don't do anything about it, then that could very well be a character issue because you're not looking to remedy yourself and those around you. And therefore, a lot of your behaviors are going to be destructive as opposed to constructive. So that's my really quick two-minute overview of my thoughts on it and my point of view. Uh, and that is mainly that unconscious bias unfairly hinders the biggest expense, which is to the team. And as a result of that fear, we've got to knock it off. We've got to get back on track. What is the answer to all these isms? Belonging. Next question, please. I'm totally kidding. I believe in belonging. I wrote an article a while back for our internal magazine. It's also shared with our customer base. Not sure uh, when that was, it was a bit ago, but uh, the title of it was, let's stop talking about diversity and let's stop talking about belonging. Because at the end of the day, if an organization truly has an inclusive environment, it can maximize the power of the diversity they already have, which by the way, attracts more diversity uh, if they are able to create an inclusive environment. Now, if that inclusive environment is true, the litmus test for said environment is belonging. So I think I've asked you this before, uh, say, but have you ever been invited to anything at all? Anything? Yes. Of course you have. Great, great answer. Have you ever been invited to something where you didn't quite feel like you belonged? Absolutely. Absolutely. So 100% on that test uh, for you and for me as I collect this data, uh, I have not heard anyone tell me, no, I've always felt like I belong no matter where I went. It happens to all of us, including, like I mentioned, my, my middle-aged straight white guys. They don't feel accepted all the time either. So at the, at the end of the day, there's two horses of this chariot. One horse is logic and the other horse is emotion. Uh, now I'm paraphrasing terribly Socratic thinking here, but I, I, but to paraphrase it and kind of lock and load it into my own uh, thesis here, uh, if we just rely on logic, then we're probably going to have that that chariot toppled because we don't have we're not pulling in tandem. Emotion and logic have to pull in tandem. So at the end of the day, I'll ask a lot of my executives, when was that occasion where you didn't feel like you belong? And as we talk through those things. Usually it has something to do with something that's either biological or psychological or, uh, or personal or cultural. It's something that is very near and dear to us, but yet we're in an organizational construct that we have to go to 85% of our waking hours. So guess what? There's cognitive dissonance. There's, there's this feeling of not belonging because there's this, again, uh, kind of uh, standard that most of, and by the way, most of my middle-aged straight white guys don't necessarily meet that standard either, you know? It's like the proverbial Cary Grant, Brad Pitt syndrome. And, you know, they didn't even look like that in real life, uh, although I'm sure that they're wonderful men. But at the end of the day, what we really need is a better understanding of who we are individually. And now I may or may not agree with someone I meet on everything. However, as a human being, they have a right not only to exist, but the right to be heard. They have a right to be embraced and to be embraced, uh, as Dr. King said, based on their character not because of the subcultural or the sexual orientation or the skin color or whatever, or ethnicity. Uh, it, you know, I've met people who I don't necessarily want to spend time with, but you know, I happen to be a man of faith and I'm told that I'm not only supposed to love my neighbor, I'm supposed to love my enemy. That's not a lot of room for hate. As Dr. King said, the only way to overcome uh, uh, hatred is with love because uh, more hate just doesn't do it. So, you know, I know that I've been talking for a while, but let me just share real quickly. There's this, a uh, person that did the speech and talks about what is it that is really needed in any type of organizational structure. And just to paraphrase some of it, the secrets of success in life is to stay in love, they said. Staying in love gives you the fire to ignite other people, to see inside other people, to have greater desire, to get things done with other people. A person who is not in love just doesn't get it. And in order for them to get ahead and to really understand what's happening, in order for them to have that fire, I'm paraphrasing now, any other thing in life that is more exhilarating and is more positive than a feeling of love, well, I don't know what it is. So their thesis was the secret to success in life is to stay in love. And I asked people, what do you think the profession of this person was? And most people say pastor or whatever else. It was General John H. Stafford, just to give him attribution of the United States Army. And I also, also uh, John H. Stanford. So I say that uh, 
If bullets are flying overhead in a foxhole, do you not want somebody in that foxhole with you, back to back fighting that loves you? And that's absolutely true. So I believe that the way to overcome isms, uh, much credit to General Stafford, much credit to Dr. King, is to express love and not uh, an eros type of love necessarily. That's for couples, but for uh, a, a phileo love, a brotherly love, a love and a caring that says that, you know what? You're a human being just like me. I've got my problems. You've got your problems. Let's come together and see if we can't complete each other and make ourselves into one really cool executive so we can conquer some of the problems that our, that our business units are facing. I love that you take it one step further than belonging to ultimately the reason why I feel like we're all here is to love and be loved well. Like there's no human being on planet earth that doesn't want fundamentally to be loved and to love. So thank you for that. Last question. What is one practical step uh, folks watching can take to foster belonging and love, whether at their workplace or at home or their communities? I, that is such a wonderful question. I got, I got goosebumps just thinking about it. And this is my feeling. Go find that person, that group, or that organization or whatever that you've never felt comfortable with before and go participate. The best way to foster this and to get around the amygdala and really start to exercise your prefrontal cortex is to, uh, you can use what we call in our, in our practice, the tribe model. Uh, and the tribe model, because we're tribal human beings, is to kind of fake out your amygdala using your prefrontal cortex to say, you know what? You're part of my in group. You're not part of my out group. And the only way to do that really is to change your attitude or your behaviors. I believe you change your behaviors long enough, eventually your attitudes are going to change. So if your attitude isn't quite there yet, you're still feeling fearful or uncomfortable, go join that group. Go get with those people. Go have lunch with that, that individual. If your attitude can change, then it makes it a lot easier because your behavior starts to pick up where your attitude is there. As you continue to learn, read about you know, as far as my ism, the thing that I'm up against most of the time, it's obviously racism. Well, maybe it's not obvious, but it's racism. So I tell people, read uh, Akindi, uh, read D'Angelo, read Coates, uh, but don't just read the, the timely books that have come out now about racism. Listen to, to uh, Langston Hughes, or read Langston Hughes. Uh, listen to Billie Holiday sing about strange fruit. I apologize. About strange fruit and some of the things that we... Uh, remember from the days of lynchings and such. These are the types of things will bring you closer to me so that when we have a conversation, you'll understand a lot more about my pain. Um, so that would be my thing to do is to get with that person or group that you feel the most uncomfortable or the most uh, uh, discomfort with and get to know them and then understand that they may not be representative of all their groups, but some of those things that were some of those, those walls that were up in front of you will start to slowly but surely break down so that you too can experience and share some of that love that's in your heart. I love that. Yeah. Start by listening, start by understanding. Uh, if you are interested in getting a hold of Grant, good news. He's at doster, D-O-S-T-E-R training.com. If you're looking for a chief diversity officer or someone as a DEI consultant, he is your man. I highly endorse Grant. So with that, thanks for joining us. And we hope you catch our next episode and leave your comments in the uh, comments section below the video. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody. You're welcome. Okay, bye.